Oh, sorry about that, mate. These days, you see a fuel pump going through, you've got to fill up, you know what I mean? Don't know when you're going to get the chance with all this Brexit mess. Mmm, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's fine, mate. Don't worry about it, it'll be fine. I don't suppose you can direct me, do you? I don't actually know the way. No. No, I'm, I'm completely blind. I'm sorry about that, mate. Um, do you know... Do you know the big weather spoons? It's just across from there. Oh, that place. I know where you're on about now. Wait, so you can't see anything? No, not at all. I'm, I've been completely blind for a few years now. But you've got one of those white stick things. I thought they were for people who could still see something. No, no. Blind people can have them too. Well, have you not got a guidebook? They seem well useful. Uh, there's, there's lots of reasons to be honest. Uh, I'm just, I'm just not totally suited to it to be honest. So, where I picked you up from? Is that your place? Yeah. Who do you live with? I can't see you living on your own. That seems dangerous. Uh, well, I live with my partner, but plenty of blind people live on their own. Mm, I can't see how that'd work. Seems unsafe. Dangerous like. I couldn't do it, you know, I couldn't cope with losing my sight. I'd probably like top myself or something. <laughs> right, uh Yeah, lots of people say that. You off anywhere nice then today, mate? No, not really. I've just uh just gotta do a bit of work. No, I hope I've not made you late. Nah, it should be fine. I've uh, I've got pretty flexible hours. You know, that's amazing. I didn't even think people like you could go to work. What do you do? Uh, I, um, I, I run a YouTube channel. <laughs> YouTube? When you said work, I thought you meant, like, a proper job. Mm, no, no, just, just the YouTube channel. It's pretty good, though. It keeps me busy. I suppose, yeah. How long have you been doing that for, then? About... Uh, about eight months now, actually. It's, it's been pretty great. I've had a lot of fun with it. The most important question, though. When are you going to get yourself monetized on that? Oh, for fuck. Hello, everyone. Mason here. How are you doing? Today it's time for my September reading wrap up. To tell you the truth, September was a great month. Nine books I read in total, which is the most I've ever read in a single month. I'm pretty proud of that, and I enjoyed it too, which, let's be honest, is the most important thing, right? I wanted to have a little bit of fun today, so we're going to go through each book, ranking them from worst to best. Starting with... Number 9. Rock, Paper, Scissors by Ellis Feeney Despite being the lowest on the list, this atmospheric domestic thriller was actually pretty good. I just have mixed feelings on it. Whilst I had a good time with it, the more I think about it, the more flaws I find. I absolutely loved the twist, but the rest of the book doesn't live up to it, and unfortunately Ellis Feeney sort of spoiled it by adding three or four unnecessary twists on top of it. However, it was good enough that I'm interested in reading more by Alice Feeney, and I still think Rock, Paper, Scissors is worth your time, but if you're a bargain hunter like me, just wait a few months till it shows up on a sale, and then it'll definitely be worth it. I have a full review available for this one, so if you're interested in a more in-depth discussion, I'll link it in the description. Number 8. The Road Trip by Beth O'Leary I know, I know it's unbelievable. If you're a long-term regular of this channel, you'll know that I love Beth O'Leary. The Switch and the Flat Chair are two of my favourite books that I've read this year. However, perhaps because of that, my expectations were quite high, and so this second chance romance was a disappointment. I still enjoyed O'Leary's writing style, and there were some genuinely good bits. The character of Rodney, despite being a bit of a weirdo, is one of my favourite characters she's written. One of the reasons that I love O'Leary's style so much is that I find her characters so relatable, and unfortunately that just wasn't the case with either of the protagonists in The Road Trip. 
It's actually not a bad book, it's genuinely not, but it just didn't live up to my expectations and I didn't walk away from it with any of the characters in my heart the way that I did with Lena, Eileen, Tiffy or Leon. Again, the link to my full review of this will be in the description. Number 7, Kill Me Again by Rachel Abbott. This will be another shocker for regulars of the channel because I've given every other book in this series such high praise. As a lover of detective fiction, the DCI Tom Douglas series is a breath of fresh air. It's so nice to have a protagonist that isn't the stereotypical, miserable, alcoholic detective. Tom is a genuinely great character, and the more of the series I read, the more he's growing on me. Having said that, each book has two protagonists, one that's connected to the case and Tom, and this is the first of the five that I've read where I felt that Tom's part was the far more engaging storyline. The stakes were high in this one, Tom is involved on quite a personal level and there's even a scene towards the end where he becomes emotional and it's quite intense, I loved his part of the narrative. The part that let it down was Maggie Taylor. Kill Me Again is the first time that I've not connected to one of Rachel Abbott's protagonists. Usually she does a great job of reeling me in emotionally and making me feel empathy for them, but I didn't for Maggie Taylor because she's frustrating and at times downright stupid. The case itself was still pretty great and I was actually quite excited because for the first time Rachel Abbott was hinting at a serial killer with each victim showing up with three lines carved into their leg. I enjoyed the way things played out. It was cool to see Tom getting emotionally invested especially with this case being connected to one of his past unsolved cases. Unfortunately Maggie just let the whole thing down. I also don't think that the reveal had quite as much impact as it could have because I'm becoming familiar with the way that Rachel Abbott does things and that's making it easier to predict what she's going to do. Number 6 And Then She Was Gone by Lisa Jewell I think I had the opposite experience to Rock Paper Scissors with this one. Immediately after I finished reading it I wasn't that impressed but the more I thought about it and discussed it with others I actually think that it was pretty good. It centres around a woman named Laurel, 10 years after her daughter Ellie is kidnapped and she starts to learn the horrible truth. I did see a lot of what was going to happen coming and that's not me being big headed because I've heard that from a lot of people but Lisa Jewell wasn't trying to hide anything, it wasn't meant to be a twist and in terms of the actual content, the story, the characterizations and the exploration of what a child's kidnapping does to a family. I think it was pretty well done. I will say that I had a few problems with Lisa Jewell's writing style but who knows maybe it's just a one-off and I'm definitely willing to read something else by her before I form an opinion. I'm not going to focus on this one for too long because I do have a full length review once again linked in the description. Number 5 Josh and Hazel's Guide to Not Dating by Christina Lauren You know this one was actually quite a lot of fun. It's a friends to lovers odd couple contemporary romance. I really enjoyed Christina Lauren's writing style. It was pretty easy going, quite blunt, really funny in places. I'm actually quite fascinated by how the dynamic of a writing duo works. I knew I was going to like this from the intro. Hazel's prologue is funny, a bit cringeworthy but purposely so. I thought Josh and Hazel were well characterised, Hazel's quirkiness bouncing off Josh's sensibilities well and the dynamic of them being friends setting each other up on blind double dates was a lot of fun. What I will say is if you've got the choice go for the physical copy because you do not want to listen. You do not want to listen to the audiobook of this one. Jamie Matler as Hazel, pretty good. Todd Habercorn as Josh, very, very not good. In fact, I think he might be the worst narrator I've experienced this year. I hate to be harsh, I really do, but it's also justified. His versions of Hazel's voice, oh, just so awful. There was a scene where they were at a trivia night hosted by Dick Stroker, which was brilliant. 
but Stroker's voice was read by Todd Habercorn and it was just it was so ridiculous there were so many times when he did a voice for a character that wasn't Josh and I just wanted to put my fingers in my ears also those sex scenes wow I was not expecting that level of detail I was giggling away like the man child I am <laughs> I said boobs there's always a certain amount of predictability for these sorts of stories but it was fun to see how things played out and I'll definitely be picking up more by Christina Lauren at least next time I'll be more prepared for the amount of detail we get in the sex scenes number four in a dark dark wood by Ruth Ware this was my first time reading anything by Ruth Ware and I was actually impressed it centers around a woman called Nora She's a writer that lives in a tiny flat in London and one day she's invited to the hen party of a woman she hasn't seen in 10 years. At first she's not going to go but then she does a deal with her mate Nina that they'll both go if the other one does. When they show up at the hen party it's taking place in this big posh modern house that's in the middle of nowhere surrounded by, you guessed it, woods. It's isolated, there's no phone signal and somebody's going to die, obviously. This one was just a fun, bingeable read that I got through pretty quickly, to be honest. I had my problems with it, but none of them were big enough to dampen my overall enjoyment of the story. Even though I made a pretty accurate guess of what was going to happen early on, Ruth Ware still did a damn good job of making me second guess myself. I spent a lot of time trying to come up with alternate theories, which meant that I was on the edge of my seat, waiting to find out what the actual truth was. So even though I was right, it didn't feel like a disappointment. My main complaint was that Nora spent a lot of time obsessing over something that happened 10 years ago. The problem is she's only 26, so what took place happened when she was 16, which felt a little bit melodramatic. It just felt like Ruth Ware wanted Nora to be 26 and tried to crowbar the plot around that, but it didn't work. If she'd have just been a few years older, it'd have been much better. Having said that, it was definitely still worth a read. Now that we're in the month of delightful frights, if you're up for a fast, enjoyable read, I'd definitely recommend this one. Number 3. Lock Every Door by Riley Sager So I was originally going to read Survive the Night, but the mixed reactions that that book is receiving kind of put me off, not going to lie. However, since Sager is such a beloved booktube author, I really wanted to see what the hype was about. I have a review available for this one, link in the description obviously, so I'm not going to focus on it for too long. What I will say is I had a damn good time with this one. I enjoyed the setting of the Bartholomew with its creepy gothic architecture and many, many, many references to gargoyles and I also thought the almost cosy mystery vibes with Jewel setting out to uncover the truth by herself was pretty entertaining. Was it perfect? No, I still have some problems with it and there's definitely some things that didn't make sense but was it entertaining? Yeah. Sega did a great job of dropping red herrings, keeping me guessing and when the truth was finally revealed I actually really enjoyed the twist. The difference between this one and Rock Paper Scissors is I think the rest of the story worked without the twist. When this one kicks in, it gets quite intense and I really enjoyed the last third. My main complaint is that Jules didn't feel like the best protagonist and I wish she'd been a bit better. It feels like there's a disconnect between the I have no idea what's going on running around like a headless chicken version of Jules and the badass that we get at the end. I think if Jules's character had been just that little bit more consistent throughout the story and Sega could have made me actually care the whole time, this would have been a five star read. Number two, The Housemate by Nina Manning. This one's actually really good. And the best part is it's one of those free ones that you now get on your Audible membership, which means I didn't have to pay a penny for it. And that makes me an happy man. It centers around a woman named Reggie, who's trying to leave the past behind and start a new life. She's recently moved in with some younger housemates and she's starting a textiles course at university. Reggie suffers from obsessive compulsive disorder that seems to have been brought on by some traumatic events in her past. 
this leads to some pretty tense scenes because she suffers from anxiety and also maybe even some paranoid delusions. It seems that she's running away from somebody that's determined to find her. Somebody that she spots on street corners, following her, constantly ringing her phone. The problem is, you never know whether this is actually happening or not. There's also the fact that Reggie's housemate, Minnie, introduces her to the world of Cleanstagram, where she stumbles across an account by a woman named Mrs. C, whose cheery Instagram documents her orderly, spotless house, and Reggie quickly becomes fixated. As someone that enjoys both thrillers and contemporaries, this sort of feels like the best of both worlds. For the most part, this does feel like a contemporary novel, with Reggie trying to navigate the world whilst adapting to her compulsive behaviour, living with younger girls that see her as a mother of the house, and getting some joy from Cleanstagram, which I didn't even know was a thing. It's quite endearing. Anytime she feels that she can temporarily beat one of her compulsions, feeling comfortable enough to leave the window open or not need to lock and unlock the door six times, it feels like a victory and it's hard not to be happy for her. There's even a romantic element as she meets somebody from university and I thought their dynamic was quite cute. At the same time, the trauma she's been through is ever present. The compulsive behaviour is a direct result of that, and so it's on her mind a lot of the time. When Reggie's tense though, when she's panicking, when we get the scenes that deal with the stalker, this feels like a proper thriller. And as she becomes more and more obsessed with Mrs. Clean, you start to wonder whether she might be a bit more unhinged than she seems on the surface. When the climax hits, when everything comes together and everything becomes clear, it's super satisfying. It's executed brilliantly in my opinion and I was actually quite pleased. I think this one's well worth a read, especially if you've got an Audible membership with it being free. Reggie's an engaging protagonist and in my opinion the OCD never feels gimmicky. It felt real to me. However, I will say that there's massive trigger warnings for domestic abuse, so please be warned on that one. Number 1. If I Can't Have You by Charlotte Levin Oh, this book is absolutely brilliant. It's so much fun, but to be honest, I don't know what to say about it. I don't want to talk about it too much because I went in blind, not knowing anything about it, and that made it brilliant. When I enjoy a book this much, I usually do a full review, but I didn't for this one because I don't want to spoil anything. If I Can't Have You is an exploration of dangerous, toxic, obsessive love. It centres around an absolutely, completely mental, but somehow likeable protagonist called Constance. Honestly guys, this one gets crazy, it goes to places that I did not expect, it's a lot of fun and utterly bingeable. Reading this one kind of made me want to read You, and if I ever do so, then I would love to do some sort of comparison between this and that. I think it says a lot about the skill of an author when they can make me invest in a character like Constance as much as I did. She should be utterly detestable but somehow she's not she's actually a little bit endearing and sometimes pitiable as much as a lot of what she's doing is wrong it's hard not to want things to work out for her i love this one and it's stuck with me all month if you enjoy this sort of book or you trust my recommendations get and read this one so that's it September's behind us, and now we're on to spooky season. I'm personally going to be trying to dive into at least one or two horrors this month, so that should be fun for you guys. My question for today is this, what's the largest amount of books you've ever read in a single month? If you've enjoyed this video, the like and subscribe buttons are just sitting there waiting to be pressed. Now press them. Or I'll mail you a glitter bomb and it'll trash your house. <laughs> if you want to get in touch, say hi and have a chat. 
you know where the comment section is. Or you can connect with me via Twitter, the link to which is in the description. Thanks ever so much for spending time with me today guys. Until next time, take care. For now I'm off, and you should have a good one.